We're streaming. So welcome everyone to Bring Around Africa, our opportunity to hear from the contributors to our issue number 19, where we cross the Indian Ocean and hear about some of the fresh creative energies that are emerging from the continent. And we're very lucky to have a very interesting set of stories to share with you uh, today, Monday. And uh, so let me just uh, go around and uh, see who's here. First of all, we've got uh, Claire from Perth. Greetings, Claire. Hello. Uh, Dennis from uh, Nairobi in uh, Kenya. Hello, Dennis. Yeah, hello. How are you? Yes, yeah, a cold morning. Good morning. And from Nigeria, we've got uh, Okochukwo Okoko from Nigeria. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everyone. And Ngozi from Nigeria as well. Hello. Good morning. Good and, morning, everyone. Uh, from Egypt, uh, Pasant Nose. Good to see you again. Thank you, Kevin. Hello, everyone. And uh, Rebecca uh, from London. Good morning, everyone. Hello. And uh, we had Joseph from Senegal. I think he'll be joining us again later. So the plan is to uh, have a, a review of the stories that you've shared with readers so that we can uh, hear from you directly and, and think about the connections between them. But firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, uh, this Zoom meeting, although it's in the cloud, we know that uh, clouds have water in them that come to earth and this Zoom meeting has a place at the moment in Melbourne, otherwise known as Nam by the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional owners of Melbourne. So we pay respects to them before we commence. So uh, I would like to start by inviting Claire uh, to speak. Uh, Claire, you've uh, shared with us, I think, one of the most extraordinary stories that we've ever had in Garland uh, from, uh, from Africa. Uh, and uh, it would be great to just hear how this story evolved and uh, what you think the, the kernel of that story is. Okay. Um, I came across the linguist uh, sticks um, because of my interest in uh, jewellery making. I'm trained as a jewellery designer. and So when I went to Ghana um, three years ago, of course, my natural instincts was to um, you know, try and find or seek out things that I could relate to. And I immediately saw the linguist sticks that were originally um, cast in gold, you know, many, many years ago. So I started looking for casting um, houses that were still casting them in gold. But as it turned out, that doesn't exist anymore. So um, having been to a few festivals, um, I only saw one gold um, language stick, but most of them were made out of uh, carved wood. Um, so that piqued my interest. Um, it took me quite some time to um, make contacts um, on the ground locally to find out information on who makes them, where they make them, how they make them. So it took me a good, I'd say, three or four months to make those contacts. Um, the next thing was finding examples of them um, because all these linguistics are kept in uh, regional palaces or houses of um, chiefs. So getting access to that was very, very difficult. Again, that came through my contacts and I was able to make um, a couple of good, um, I guess, yeah, contacts that could help me with that. Um, the only way I found that I could uh, look at the process was to commission one. Um, I couldn't get into the palaces. Um, I couldn't approach people, um, obviously, at the Durbars or the festivals where these were being used uh, because it's, you know, interrupting the process and it's um, not, I guess, a, a correct thing to do to directly approach people while they're in the middle of a, of a process. So um, I was recommended to go and see a brewery craft village where this gentleman, um, Michael Opong, um, had 
pride of place amongst the woodcarvers. And I talked to him about what I was looking for and he said, yes, ma'am, I'll make you one. So that's how it all started. Um, I sat down and um, I said, I would like to, you know, record the process. I would like to talk to you about it. Um, it was very difficult <laughs> trying to get anything out of him uh, because to him, it wasn't an artistic practice. It was a job that required obviously you know an exchange of money and his main concern was doing a good job um, so the one thing that i learned from the the whole process of this was the way that different cultures view arts and crafts and the place that they have in daily life so as, as a westerner i see um, arts and crafts as a luxury item, you know, something to be enjoyed while being created, um, something to be uh, revered. But for Michael, it was a, a means to an end. And enjoyment for him and appreciation was not necessarily a concern. His concern was doing a good job to represent the purpose of the item. So that's a quite a um, a revelation, I think. <laughs> yes, certainly. Claire, I've <laughs> because got I'm one, going, yeah. one question and I'm just dying to ask you. Uh, you know, your photographs are so extraordinary. Here you have uh, at the Millet Festival, the village chiefs and so on, all sitting around. Uh, and I don't see anyone else like you there. I presume it's you who took the photo. Yes, so, yeah. What did, uh, they, what did they make of your presence? Obviously, they, they respected you enough to be able to <clears throat> allow you to photograph these very important scenes. Uh, yes. Uh, some of these Durbars or festivals um, are tourist attractions, but we went, again, through our local uh, guide and contact. That's how we knew about it. Um, but, yes, we were one of very few, um, I guess, white people there, but they would totally um they were so welcoming um to them the importance of the the situation was to get the job done you know is to talk about local business is to make sure um, the linguists get the message across um to make sure everything goes to plan so someone like me um going in and out was of no concern to them none at all mm -hmm. Um, for, for this particular festival, um, I was very lucky that I was able to sit in with the chief's courtiers right alongside um, his throne where he sits to conduct business. And I sat there quietly and I sat next to one of the sword bearers and uh, <laughs> I was just kept snapping away as much as I could. Um, yeah, I, I can't tell you how, how welcoming and how respectful they are of everybody that, that turns up to these um, situations. It, well, we're very grateful that you shared yeah. this with us, uh, Claire, and yeah. uh, shows us that this form of tradition is still very much alive. It does talk about the importance of an object as a means of speech, and that relates Absolutely. in Australia to the Aboriginal message sticks and other objects that enable people to speak, particularly in ritual circumstances. And yeah. uh, your understanding as a maker about the processes involved, I think gives you a particular insight as well. So mm. very, very grateful for that. Um, if we could go on, uh, Dennis, are you there? And uh, tell us about uh, the story you shared with us uh, from the, the Maasai. Oh, yes. Uh, this uh, uh, story uh, comes out a broader uh, picture. I work in an institution where we try to teach uh, African culture in a systematic manner because we believe that uh, uh, just uh, walking around with people and just talking casually, you don't get into the culture. You get a lot of uh, stereotypes. So this story is coming out of a broader picture 
of uh, teaching culture through what we call uh, 15 cultural themes or ideas that people hold in consciousness. And what intrigued me when you contacted me about this, of course, after looking at my work on the doctoral studies, is that uh, I was not very keen on the beadwork. But once you, you talked to me, then I, I started looking at, I mean, the, the, the value of uh, art in this uh, concept of uh, marriage. So marriage is actually one of the 15 themes that we use to, to teach culture. And it belongs to an area where we are calling it the foundations of uh, human life. So one question uh, that these themes uh, try to answer is how do you organize life? So this part of uh, art that we are looking at, uh, the beadwork, belongs to a, another set of uh, activities that we call uh, domains of uh, African culture. So one of the domains is art. And uh, when uh, uh, the Maasai in particular uh, do their ceremonies, uh, a lot of beadwork is involved, especially this uh, Enkarewa. Unfortunately, uh, when you asked me to look at this uh, particular art, the, it was already during a period of uh, the coronavirus and a lot of uh, weddings cannot take place in, uh, in public. So it was not uh, easy for me to go back and uh, maybe participate in uh, some of the ceremonies where they, they use this beadwork. Uh, and as it stated in the, in the story, uh, this is uh, a thing or a, a beadwork uh, that is done especially at the wedding ceremony and uh, the, 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 the hangings and the, the Maasai in particular uh, still uh, keep intact uh, most of their uh, cultural uh, uh, artifacts but also uh, things that they make to beautify or to, or to put uh, ornaments on a woman when they are uh, they are getting married because uh, marriage is seen. Marriage is seen as a very, very uh, important part of the life of an individual, because then uh, it fulfills or it uh, perpetuates uh, one of the African themes, the theme on uh, African lineage or African family. And uh, marriage is the the context uh, within which uh, uh, Africans and the Maasai in particular would like uh, life to be perpetuated, life to be continued. So it is only within marriage that that, uh, that takes place. That is why marriage is not a one-off thing. It is not just the wedding uh, uh, that uh, makes the marriage, but it's a process, uh, as uh, people are going to read in the article, a process that take, uh, starts from uh, childhood and uh, the women are prepared for marriage, the young men are prepared for marriage. And when uh, the culmination arrives, when the ornaments are put on, then it uh, demonstrates the apex of a very, very important uh, aspect of the life of an, of an individual, both the, the woman and the, and the, the young man. Sure. However, there is a lot of emphasis on the, on the woman because uh, that is the gateway of life, as I would say it. That's the gateway that uh, life uh, comes into the, the community. And the Maasai Certainly. are very particular about that. Thank you very and much. The Maasai uh, are, this. We'll, have to, we'll have to move on from this and come back to it later. Uh, I think yes. uh, you've shown how the investment of time particularly and uh, skill involved in that necklace is a way of showing the importance of, of marriage for the mass yes. something which is a, a living tradition so thank you very much uh, yes. for that i'm sure there's a lot more to say uh, and we hope that you'll share some more stories with us 
uh, in the future. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, partic I'm particularly happy that uh, I think you you told me this is the first thing, the first one that is coming out of Kenya. Yes, yes. We hope to have another story about Kenyan fashion soon. That's coming up. But uh, we're very okay. pleased that uh, you've been able to share something with us. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if we can go to uh, uh, Ogotukwo Okpoko, uh, welcome. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. So, okay, we, so um, we're very happy to, to share the work that you had in the, the project for entanglements, which was the... Yes, re-entanglements, yes. Re-entanglements, which was the... Uh, project uh, looking at the legacy of Northcote Thomas, the English anthropologist. Yes. So tell um, us your story. Okay, um, last year, um, in the year 2018, as soon as I graduated um, from in UNA, University of Nigeria, Asuka, um, I was given the opportunity to um, send in a proposal to participate in this workshop. So um, it's about re-engaging with the photographs of North Coast Thomas, which was taken in the early 19th century. Um, so um, being a textile artist, I decided to explore my in textile design. This, the photographs I saw that intrigued me the most were those of my own hometown. When I first um, came, when I first got to see this, um, the archives, the digital archives, I was really intrigued to um, discover that these murals, these early designs that I've been hearing about were actually done in my hometown, Agu, in Anambra State, Nigeria. So these um, these murals you see on the screen, they are the ones I chose to um, base my own exploration on. They are murals done by the Agu people in southeastern Nigeria. Um, and as first, when I learned about the early designs, I mostly saw them depicted in uh, in paintings, mural paintings, and oil on, on canvases. And, I, and my lecturer is usually um, used headstone colors, which was what was used as of then. Because back then, they didn't have much of these vibrant hues that we have today. So um, when I had the opportunity to do my own work based on these photographs, I, I wanted to explore in a different medium than I, than I saw um, mostly, which is textiles. So I use the uh, fiber, acrylic, and fabric to create these works. There are three different works, all sized at um, two by five feet. And the title of my work is The Beauty Within. Um, when you look at the illustrations, you see a depiction of the man, the, the scorpion, the python over there. So the idea of the, um, the title, The Beauty Within, shows how man as of then lives in harmony with his environment, and there's also the moon. Um, and there, there was no there was no rank of between man and the and all these elements. You see, um, as at that time, if someone kills a python by mistake, he is he or she is required to bury them as they would a human being. And if they found these things in their house, they are they are they are required to let it out instead of them to kill it, as opposed to how it is mostly these days. So um, the moon is also a natural element that um, reflects the lunar calendar of people. It's what is provided occasions for folk tales, entertainment, all the things, all the tradition, all the cultural um, activities they did as at that time. Um, so um, my idea was so that that, that was why I, I tried to introduce the thing to show how man as at then they may have seen like looking at them with their half clothed um, attires, it seems like they are lacking, they don't have the uh, necessities that we have as, as of now. But when you look at how they relate from the image, from the photographs I saw, how they have them, they were um, uh, doing, I, I, I saw some of them doing wrestling matches, they were all looking very happy, exuding happiness yet. So that's, that's why I entitled it. So for the first work, I, and it was using, I used tapestry weaving technique to create this first work. And I used them the monochromatic colors similar to what they had at that time. Then the second one is in a tiled form. This, this is tapestry. The tapestries were placed side by side with the 
monochromatic colors to juxtapose, to create the kind of juxtaposition to see how then the contrast, the, the contrast between how things can be done now as opposed to how it was done then. And then the last one was done using the tapestry and um, embroidery, embroidery stitching technique to create that um, very vibrant color field, um, um, field that you see there. So um, I can say that um, from my from the opportunity I got to be engaged to engage with these photographs, I really learned a lot from um, the past because I, I I can say that in my generation today, we are, many people, many of us don't know about these artifacts. I mean, um, when this when these things came up, it also helped to solve um, disputes. I mean, um, like the Omo of Mopana um, in Asaba, she 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 used the photograph of an Omo that was back then because they didn't believe that a woman could be um, uh, for, um, have authority. So then they, so they opposed her position. So it was when she showed them these photographs, when um, it was revealed to us that the dispute was settled as well, that the lady can actually hold power. So this, this, um, this, um, this thing also opened my eyes to how things are back then. Because from what we know generally, it's, it, it's kind of seems that women as at that time held no power. They are meant to be always behind the man. So looking at photographs where um, a woman was also in power as at that time really it was really exposed a lot of things and we learned a lot from our culture even more than we thought we knew so I, have, I can say that i have a newfound respect for my ancestors i mean the kind of as they did as at that time mm -hmm. and also I, I had an idea that this was also done in my own village because right now those things are not present i haven't seen any of them even though i go back to that place every single day so seeing those things has really um, opened my eyes to a lot of things, and I plan to re-engage with these uh, works and explore in for that in the future. Well, that's a, a wonderful story uh, to hear, Oguchuku. Thank you very much for for sharing it with us, and uh, congratulations on uh, such a uh, masterful technique, but also for your recovery of uh, knowledge. Colonialism, as we know, has many sins. There's great exploitation and uh, repression involved in it but it's good that something can be recovered from that legacy that gives yes. artists like you some power uh, to have a voice so thank you very much uh, if we could thank now you. go to Ngozi because you're uh, in a similar place to Ogochoko in Nigeria uh, welcome can you share us uh, your story thank you um, the idea of uh, making uh, an elephant or um, my seeing my father as an elephant um i i got this idea of trying to reconnect with uh, uh, his death and then uh, i thought of a way of closing the yearning to see how i can just not feel so bad when i remember that he has passed away because we were so close together when I was small. And even when I have grown up, it was still my strength. So uh, I thought of ideas, how do I do this? Because I found out that I draw strength from my work. I try to describe my uh, uh, experiences through art. So I thought about the, the basic elements or the most uh, suitable, uh, art form to describe who he was to me and who I still see him as. So I thought about the name that his mother calls him or remain. So in traditional Igbo society, we have several um, names related to uh, elephants, Anonenyi, uh, Nabenyi, and several others. So I thought about his own or remain the strength of an elephant. And he's someone that, according to my sister, he will, she will always say that he was the one that killed himself with so much work. He's a kind of workaholic. So I thought about that strength. And then uh, I thought about the similar emotion that we share with elephant, uh, human being shares with elephant. Not just the, the idea of my father bearing that name, but since uh, human beings uh, shares a lot of uh, emotional qualities with elephant, how they celebrate their um, uh, birth, how they mourn the departed, even they bury sometimes. 
we could gather wood or stone and bury uh, a, an, um, some, uh, an elephant or something like that. Not an elephant, but I had a documentary that I watched where they, on a stampede, they killed a man. So they waited for a while, mourning the man, and then they covered the man with some debris around. So I saw that and I see this is something I'm trying to understand, trying to remember and trying to reconnect with my father. So I went into making that elephant after discussing with the CCA founder, founder, this is Eva. So she encouraged me much about discussing that and not just discussing, but put it to reality. And that's how the solo show came about at the CCA in Lagos. So, and then from there, I have involved into making other uh, uh, suspended works that I try to borrow elements from the immediate uh, uh, traditional portals, like the spikes, the motif, or the spherical uh, shape of the pots. So I borrowed those things to make, make a miniature um, or multiple units then I use that to install and make a bigger work. So the artwork has, uh, my process has evolved over time and I'm trying to incorporate other aesthetics from uh, that who, that is eroding kind of in traditional poetry of Nrobo and Handeg. Yeah, aesthetics are being uh, kind of uh, going extinct. So I'm trying to see how I can borrow the, those elements and make contemporary verses. And also uh, the way they have adapted in the contemporary times now, they have shifted from making the aesthetic pots to making them um, uh, uh, pots, honey pots, where they can generate revenue for their family. So I'm trying to adapt that as well into my own making something, uh, a, a pot for honey that will not be uh, broken at the end of the day. Or the way they harvest the honey, they have to kill the bees before harvesting it. Based on that, they, they cannot open the pot without uh, cracking, uh, without uh, smoking or you know, in fact, open fire upon the bees before they drive the bees away and then crack the pot and harvest honey. So I'm trying to see a way of making this pot in the form that you can open the globe, harvest the bowl of uh, honey inside, and then still use it again, re like reusing it, not necessarily cracking each time you have to harvest your, your honey. Well, thank you very much, Ngozi. And uh, uh, clearly you carry a lot of your father's determination and workaholism uh, in, in your own career not only to produce uh, lots of installations like the great installation at the Chongju International Craft Biennale last year uh, to inspire people to work hard, but also your work in recovering some of the ceramic techniques and producing works that are not only beautiful, but uh, useful as well, both for people and for, for nature. So thank you so much, Ngozi, for that. Uh, Joseph, can we now go to Senegal? Welcome. And uh, to share your story, uh, which is a very dramatic story of the fake line, the sim. Yes. Uh, first of all, good morning, everyone, Kevin, and good morning to the, uh, the African contributor, contributors of, for, of this Garand magazine. I would like to express my congratulations for this good work. So about my articles, the title is Simb, or, or the rise and fall of the fake lion in Senegal. So through this article, I try to share my, my experience as a, when I was when I was child. And you know, like Simb is called like the, the fake lion. So the fake lion is a famous or was a famous street festival of Senegal. As maybe some of you know, like the symbol of Senegal is the lion, the national symbol, like official symbols of our country is the lion and the baobab tree. So this culture of the of fake lion is closely linked to, to, the Senegalese, uh, to the Senegalese culture. 
So what is exactly the Fake Fake Lion like is, is, a, street, is a street festival where like men, like they, like men, where men, they change to, to like to, to, to fake lions. And this is like, this is irritated from, from generation to generation. And also this, uh, this is about culture, but also it, it includes like a lot of like craft. For example, if you look at this picture, we can see like, for example, the costume made of, you can see the curry, the shells, and also like the, the animal skins and so on. So this culture also is, I try also to show how culture and craft are like closely, closely linked. Yes, that's, uh, that's it. And unfortunately, like uh, this, this culture, this unique culture of Senegal like is, is disappearing. Why is it disappearing? Because of modernism, yes, and also because of technology. So that is why also, and I try to, to see, like to, to explore through this culture, how we can like revive, how we can revamp like the, the, the history. Yes, that's... Uh, and so how uh, do you think uh, it, it can be revived? What do you think the answer is, Joseph? I think it's just, uh, as I mentioned in the article, it is uh, with the strong willingness of the actors, like the fake line themselves. Like they have to, they have to, they have to try to, they have to try, how can I say, they have to try to bring back the uniqueness of the fake lion. This is one, and also the, uh, the, the authorities, our authorities in charge of, of culture, also, they need to support this, uh, the, this, this culture. And also, this culture like supports, for example, it, it helps the community to know each other. Because right now, if, for example, if, in, if it's about Dakar or like the bigger city in Senegal, like it's mainly like modern cities. It's all, everywhere building and people, they don't know each other. But this kind, of, this kind of culture also, it helps the people, the neighborhood, the, uh, the community, to, to, know each, uh, to know each other. Another point also is through the fake lion, the, the rise and fall of the fake lion, I also try to raise the alert about the extent of the Senegalese and African lions. So this is, uh, mm -hmm. and also I use some techniques. For example, I try to make the reader to, to I try to make the reader to feel how, the, how is like the fake lion show about the terror, the mysticism, and all of that. And also, like I, I did some research, also I tried to select the, some kind like powerful pictures so that the reader can, can, can experience, can really experience what is like the, the, the fake lion. Well, you so, certainly yes. do with those sorts of images, Joseph, they're very powerful. And mm -hmm. you can imagine that uh, certainly within a festival context that uh, something like this would be very powerful, but maybe in terms of uh, strength, is there a way of marrying the fake line with the kind of elephant we find in Ngorsi to, <laughs> to give courage for that kind of revival as well? It seems that uh, these animals are very, still very powerful forces in culture in different uh, African contexts. Yes, so, thank, you. Mm -hmm. thank you very much, Joseph. Mm -hmm. Now, thank if you, we Kevin. could uh, turn to Pasent, uh, to Egypt now, to the north of Africa, welcome to you. You've, uh, you've made a significant contribution no, in two Kevin, magnificent yes. articles in our issue. Thank Clearly you very you're much. very proud thank of you. your Egyptian culture. Well, I'm, I'm, I can't say no, but I'm, usually I'm very proud with any culture. Like, I'm, I'm so touched whenever there is a cultural product, if we can call it so, or uh, anything that is with tradition that reflects um, the, the, the roots of any culture. I, I've, this is the thing that I've um, always admired since I was a little kid. So, uh, well, writing the two stories. articles was, mm -hmm. yeah, writing the two articles was a bit hard for me because I, I couldn't really choose which, which craft I should express or, or tell the story of. But I, I thought 
uh, choosing the, the We Sosophy article or the, the tapestries of Lisa Wasif, who's, um, who, who, who really touched me since uh, I was three. Um, and, and it was, to me, it was like the first step to, to understand what's the meaning of a craft and how it's done and, and all of that. And uh, the other article, which is the Nyalo one, was a bit intriguing because it's called Nyalo, which is uh, in, in Arabic or the language, the, the Egyptian dialect, meaning to make the, the product age or, or to make it look like an antique. And in Arabic, it's called, in Egypt, it, they call the same craft takfit, which is in laying. So, in fact, the craft is with more than one technique in the same craft. And actually, both articles were, in my opinion, very rich with things to share. But unfortunately, I was a bit uh, uh, like tight in how to express them and be to the point. So the the uh, the the, the Wisa Wasif was a re in my opinion was a really good example to follow in uh, introducing the craft to a society to a village that had no other craft but the usual agri uh, agricultural life in Egypt in the the uh, the out of city villages and how he introduced it to the little kids and how they interacted and he just allowed the pioneer the Wisa Wasif who, who started this philosophy of his and started experimenting in this village, just allowed the kids to, to get, to tap into their natural and, and uh, built in creativity so that it can flow out. And from that, it, uh, it made a lot of progress. Uh, of course, the, the children he started with are now like uh, old age uh, artisans, but I mean, it's it's it you can't mistake the, the the theme of the place and how the people interact there and how it affected their lives and actually i don't think that when he started he had like a a, um, a specific image about how things would turn in the future but i mean he was experimenting himself as well and his philosophy and his uh, uh, view of life and and discovering that well, his instincts were right, were true. As for the Nyelo, uh, it's an, a very traditional craft in Egypt. And, and again, it's, it's one of the methods used in this craft is Nyelo. Uh, other, uh, others are like, uh, um, if we can call it, uh, hammering, brass hammering, or... Uh, um, uh, the use cutting, the use uh, engraving, and the use in laying, and the use numerous techniques within the same craft, using the brass and copper and silver and gold, and sometimes, and uh, of course they make very valuable and, and uh, uh, unique pieces. And as as much as it's rooted in the Egyptian culture, it even started like way behind since the ancient Egyptians, yet it, it carried on evolving and taking different phases through different uh, uh, timings. So, and, and every culture Egypt went through and came out of put its print on the craft till we have how it looks like now. And of course, it's the, the main concern is how to maintain this craft and, and keep the, the interest, whether from those who work within the craft or those who get the craft and buy the craft and admire the craft. So, yes, well, we certainly see a level of great, as we've said before, great ambition, certainly with the piece that you profile in the yellow. I hope we can keep, uh, keep tabs of this progress, and when it's finally finished, this piece, we can share it with the yeah. readers. Uh, I promised to, to, to send you photos because this was the, the first thing I asked the guy to, to do. I, I've said, whenever you're done, send me pictures and I'll come and, and see it myself. So uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I've, I've already uh, been overwhelmed with the project and how ambitious it was. Yes. 
So thank you very much, uh, Pasen, for, for that. And uh, hope thank you for the opportunity. It's really the beginning of some wonderful thread of stories from, from Egypt, from North Africa. And thank uh, you very much. It shows that those, those, those legacies are still alive, the visions of those people who established them are flourishing today. I know that uh, I think uh, the tapestries are going to be shown at the Selfridge uh, World Craft Fair in London later this year. So uh, that will be a good way for that to continue. Well, they, they, they have been also shown in like many, many, many prompt exhibitions and fairs and they, they already reached some levels that the majority of crafts couldn't reach. And actually their means were very local and very uh, primitive, if we can use the word primitive or natural or, or um, uh, spontaneous. You know, it's, it wasn't a plan with marketing and with, you know, the, 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 sometimes we mix the thing uh, of crafts and we want it to, to show as if it's, it's a market or a business oriented approach. And actually this is the absolute contrary. And yet they have reached the, the, the highest levels in, in outreach, if we can call it, and in networking and in, and in demand as well. Right, it's the power of a vision. It's very inspiring. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca, yeah. you've, uh, you're there from London to tell us about your story from Mali, is that right? Yes, that's right. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Flasley, for um, inviting inviting us to talk about our, our projects. Um, so I'd like to talk very briefly about um, a collaborative project that um, I worked on um, a couple of years ago in Mali with um, a very celebrated natural dye artisan there uh, called Bubika Dumbia. Uh, at that time, I was senior designer for a, a UK retailer um, and uh, part of the ethos of our of our of our business was to connect with 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 craft from around the world um, and so uh, my own particular passion is in in color and and dyes I have a textile background um, so you know we we reached out and uh, this seemed like a, a wonderful opportunity to, for me to personally explore um, a, a new a new technique and to uh, create a, a, a great commercial opportunity for um, the artisan group we were working with. So um, I traveled to Segu uh, on the banks of the River Niger um, and uh, it was kind of an amazing experience because I was working with with mud which something I'd never worked with before, um, quite a quite a challenging material. Um, so I was very, very much uh, in the hands of, of Bubika and together we, we worked and discussed designs, technique possibilities, um, and uh, created a range of uh, cushions and home accessories um, for um, the, the UK market. Um, and I think what became really important to me is that, that, that feeling of being sometimes stepping outside your, your, your kind of comfort zone and, and um, connecting with, with, with traditions and you know, new ways of creating color, new ways of looking at the possibilities of um, you know, working to create more sustainable products. Um, you know, my, my personal uh, interest is uh, in um, sort of more nat natural colors, but I'd, I'd never worked with this particular technique, which is called uh, Bogolan Fini or mud cloth. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing um, tradition where leaves from the Ngalma plant are, are um, pounded and then soaked um, to create a sort of color base. And then um, the, the mud from the, the banks of the, from the bottom of the Niger is, is put on top of the cloth and the combination of the tannin in the leaves and the iron in the mud creates a really wonderful, dense, deep, dark black color. So, um, you know, I was personally interested in exploring the color possibilities, but of course, along with that came really extraordinary stories of symbols and culture and how the cloth had been worn 
you know, traditionally for, you know, very um, sort of cultural reasons. So, you know, whilst that was not um, my, my main um, focus, um, actually what was really amazing is to be able to use um, uh, tradition and, and work, work, work together to come up with something that had, had, had some sort of res resonance for both of us. So I think um, in that respect, it was, a, it was a really successful project. Yeah, well, thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. I think your essay reflects uh, what we saw in Claire's story, uh, which is somebody who not only reports on what they see, but also uh, gets their hands dirty and uh, learns from the feel and texture of things as well, so can report from that experience as well as the information which your article does beautifully. <clears throat> now in the, in the brief time that uh, we have left, I want to uh, pose a question. And this is uh, an, a, an important question for the Garland journey, which as you know, is a five year overview, nearly coming towards an end of the creative energies and stories across the Indo-Pacific. And what you've shared, and I think this is very important to bring us together now, is, is something about the dilemma of development that uh, in most countries, uh, when they look at uh, coming out of poverty, of acquiring education, uh, of uh, developing services, it's usually something which involves uh, adopting a particular model, often it's a Western model of what a society is, and the more traditional elements the more unique elements uh, tend to wither, tend to decline, and they're seen as backward uh, and things to be left behind. Now, many of the stories that you reflect uh, show how these traditions can endure. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes they endure for tourists, uh, and in that way they can acquire a foreign audience which provides livelihood but that's fickle as we know now during lockdown there are no tourists so what happens to the to the to that culture now what is the local audience so so my question is about uh, what we see across uh, the wider world which is a kind of a craft renaissance uh, kind of a recovery of uh, these traditions bringing artifacts back into life <clears throat> learning the skills that were lost because I think uh, when considering how we reconnect with our traditions, uh, particularly in a modern context, it's often part of a movement. As we saw in the 19th century in, in England with the arts and crafts movement, there was a lot of people coming together who sought to recover this. And I'm just interested to know whether you think there are elements of that in Africa today in your countries or elsewhere, you know, whether you see a renewed interest uh, in the traditions, particularly the craft traditions. Would anyone like to start off? Um, in Ghana, they've just opened um, up a fantastic, in, in Accra, they've just opened up a fantastic um, contemporary um, art gallery, which is, is just phenomenal. Um, that's showcasing local contemporary artists. Um, but what I worry about is what you've just said, Kevin, is the more local on the ground, traditional arts and crafts that are being lost um, because they're not being recorded. Um, they're not being put in places that have easy access to get the information from. Um, when I was doing my article, I found that most of the research was done by um, overseas scholars, so it wasn't accessible. So I think in terms of a revival, it needs to be probably done through contemporary art channels. I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, we do have both um, the case of, uh, well, both Ngozi and uh, Oguchukwu were involved in a project re-entanglements which went via the, the um, School of Oriental and African Studies in London, following the, the path of uh, Northcote Thomas and the, the recordings and the photographs 
that were his legacy. And I'm curious from both Ngozi and Ogachukwu whether you think this has momentum, has it a future or is it a one-off project? Do you see a continuing interest in those sorts of traditions? Ngozi? Okay. Yes. What I will say about the continuation is that uh, already only uh, traditional painting has been explored and seeing uh, a vast uh, idea from a not cut uh, archival material is something that will not just stop now. People will pursue the idea further, they're borrowing more uh, motifs and then designs that they have not seen before. Uh, like Ogochuku uh, said, ideas that they have not seen before was shown to us. So uh, it's, an, uh, it's an, an avenue that will not close anytime soon, but I don't know about the workshop, but uh, individually is going to be borrowed from, that. Uh, they will borrow from the archival material more, more, most often. Mm -hmm. It's getting that archival material um, to be preserved. I found that was a difficulty for me, finding um, the material to start with, especially in Accra. But it's obviously different in every every um, country, depending on how developed their, their arts tradition is, I suppose. Yes, and what do you think, Okuchukwa, uh, of this? Yeah, um, I think that this tradition is going to be dying anytime soon. Um, as my lecturer, my former lecturer, Dr. Ba, also uh, mentioned how ever since she came in contact with this um, archive, that she started introducing all her students to these photographs and teaching them about these traditions that have seemed to be um, lost. So um, she, has, she has actually committed to teaching um, every student that passes through her in University of Nigeria, Suka, the Department of Fine and Applied Arts. And also, um, um, our works that are exhibited in the museums in the UK, they are also going to help share the story and more people are going to know about it. I think it's, uh, it's a movement that is, that is going to go forward as if we keep sharing these stories, it won't be forgotten or it won't die. Mm. That's what I think. What about Joseph in Senegal? Uh, Senegal, of course, was one of the leading countries in African Renaissance with uh, Senghor championing negritude uh, as yes. being a distinct African way of thinking associated with oral wisdom. And uh, uh, I wonder to what extent that still holds. That was a movement which captured the imaginations of people around the world, particularly in France. People like Jean-Paul Sartre and so on were very keen as well as the post-colonial yes. thinkers in Martinique. Uh, is it still relevant or are there are different issues at play in Senegal at the moment? Yeah, I think it is still relevant. For example, there is uh, the Biennale, Donc la, la Biennale des Arts. So it's, I think, every, every, twi every uh, like it's two years, like, and that's this, this cultural event, like Gaza's like almost older, the craft thinkers like around the world. And also, as you may know, like Senegal, Senegal is like worldwide, like connected with the culture, with the tradition. And for example, there are some cultural also events like the Festival of Jazz, International Festival of Jazz in Saint in the North. And people, they use this kind of uh, cultural events, like also to promote the craft uh, Renaissance, because at the same time, there is like the, there is the show, and on the other side, like you can have also the fair, like a fair where the people come and they show and also they sell like the craft products for the tourists, for the visitors and also for the locals. But also I would like to, to emphasize like about one thing, it is about the renaissance of the wax textile. I think we discussed about it some months ago. Now more and more startups like young, young generation, young people, they get involved in this new kind of business to innovate by using the social media, by using also the technology to, to innovate and make, to, to develop the new product based on wax and also to commercialize, to commercialize them. So I think also this is a very, very important like to, to emphasize. Mm -hmm. The way like the people, especially the new generation, they are like, uh, 
going back to the tradition and then trying to innovate to develop new uh, new products. So. Well, it's such a distinct uh, design, the, the wax prints. Uh, we've just published a story today about uh, masks being made in Melbourne from wax prints from Nigeria and other countries. So it's uh, mm -hmm. the lockdown has provided an opportunity for those kinds of businesses as well. Uh, I wonder from uh, Kenya, Dennis, uh, you're an academic, uh, I believe, in a, in a religious college, is that right? Yes, Tangaza University College. What do you think the role of religion is in terms of uh, connecting to traditions? Because often missionaries, for instance, were seen as people who would uh, try and take people away from their traditional beliefs, from their superstitions and so on. Uh, what role do you think religion plays today? Religion plays a, a big role, especially when they talk about enculturation which in my view is not yet uh, well uh, developed, it still uh, looks at uh, uh, local cultures as kind of inferior, which I think is a, is a wrong uh, way of uh, looking at things. If you want to promote uh, a serious dialogue, then when you look at uh, one culture as uh, inferior, then uh, that dialogue does not begin to, does not take off in the sense that uh, uh, what I see also among many uh, religious people is that uh, they, they have a yardstick that is Christianity, and that is what they want to use. They, in fact, in the program where I work, uh, a lot of religious, are, uh, they resist uh, a systematic study of African culture. And uh, those who have done it, have found it very rich, and have found it uh, to be a way of life that en enriches uh, a human being. And uh, those who have done it are uh, our ambassadors out there and they're trying to, to help to, to, to not really to bring back because African culture has not gone away. It is there, it's lingering uh, in the minds of people. It is the, 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 the foundation of our people's lives. So when you talk about it, then you see uh, people beaming you see it uh, coming back. So uh, religion has uh, somehow uh, stopped uh, uh, this movement, but uh, in terms of uh, bringing back uh, this idea of enculturation, this idea of interfaith dialogue, which is also in Tangaza, and I'm trying to, to see how do you bring in uh, African religion as also a player in this uh, interfaith uh, uh, dialogue? So I think those are the ways in which uh, this can be done. But also uh, in terms of schools, in Kenya there are uh, music festivals every year for primary school and secondary school. And many of these uh, uh, things are promoted by religious people. And uh, when they display the music uh, that is accompanied by the art, then the younger people are able to, 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 to be alive uh, to these uh, rich traditions and also these very rich uh, artifacts that people make that are not only, as uh, I think Rebecca was saying, it's not only a tourist thing, but it's also something that says a lot about uh, African life. I think that is... Uh, uh, the way to go, but religion, I think, uh, uh, plays a big role and should continue to play that big role because also they have the resources to to, to put into uh, these uh, trainings of uh, people and also uh, this uh, education that people should get uh, towards appreciating more uh, where they, they come from and the foundation of their life. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. And certainly we found in the uh, Southern African stories the concept of Ubuntu, which is uh, obviously a Bantu concept very much aligned with uh, Christian concepts of forgiveness. And uh, so uh, we can see the way in which Christianity can take on distinct African characteristics, which leads to a renewed interest in the life of ancestors and tradition. I'm wondering, uh, Pasant, from... Egypt, do you have anything to, to add to this from a North African perspective? Well, the, the, uh, 
the traditions in North Africa ha still exist. So accordingly, the effect of having the, the, the crafts in general uh, being somehow fed and, and develop along the time is still there, specifically with the countries that still keep some of their traditional customs. And accordingly, their traditional crafts are still taking place and, and developing. Uh, but and of course there are many events taking place uh, along the North African region, uh, whether it's uh, international fairs, uh, exhibitions, uh, uh, salon de, 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 de l'artisanat in many countries as they call it, or the, the and and of course the international craft fair in Egypt and and many others. Uh, but I I cannot avoid uh, highlighting the importance of the traditional and domestic markets as well, because this plays the role of making crafts as the art of evil, or the art of living as it is originally. Like crafts w weren't made to, to please tourists or attract tourists or to be sold to tourists. Actually the opposite that happened. It was the way of living of different cultures. And when tourism started, they were fascinated with the difference between their own culture and the culture they are visiting. Accordingly, they would want to keep a souvenir from that culture. But if, if we can make sure that the tradition keeps on going on a domestic level, it would make, it would bridge the gap that is happening between the craft and its own user and its original users. And I think this would make a lot of difference in, in developing and maintaining. And in, of course, I'm not saying that we, we, we shouldn't cater for other, for other demands, but I mean, as long as you're maintaining your, the, the original demand, it's kind of safeguarding the, the craft from being demolished or, or uh, um, threatened, becoming threatened or any of that. So, oh, and thank uh, God for... Please. Thank God for... for for some of the traditions that still kept within the region that makes sure that some of those crafts are still going on. Yes, due to the dedication of the craftspeople and the loyalty exactly. of uh, their clients and uh, audiences and communities. And uh, it's a good note to end on, Placent, as uh, the lockdown provides us with a challenge really to reconnect with our local communities and exactly. uh, a lot of work there for the World Crafts Council in, in Africa, uh, yeah. which you're a proud uh, representative of, and also for the One Village, One Product Network, Joseph, in Senegal, that uh, you're involved in as well, uh, to try and uh, help reconnect uh, these activities with the local audiences. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing this, for thank getting you. up so early on the other side. Well, we're on the other side of the world, but on both sides mm -hmm. of the world. And uh, we wish to continue this dialogue uh, as we continue our journey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice meeting you all. Thank you. Thank nice you. Nice Thank you. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry. Um, stop.